Lecture 2.4, Orbital Energetics. In this section, we'll calculate the energy of a planet in elliptical orbit. The total energy is the kinetic plus potential energy, which is just 1 half mv squared minus gmm over r. And the second term is the, yeah, the gravitational potential energy associated with that, with Newton's law of universal gravity. Because the gravitational force is conservative, the total energy is conserved. So because it's conserved, because the total energy is conserved, that means we can evaluate it at any point in the orbit of the planet around the sun, and we should get the same value. So let's pick the perihelion point where the planet is closest to the sun to evaluate um, the kinetic and potential energies. So we'll plug in VP, that's the perihelion velocity, and the perihelion distance. Remember that the perihelion velocity was the square root of this term here, so when you square it, the square root goes away. That's on one of those uh, equation slides. And the perihelion distance is just the semi-major axis times 1 minus the eccentricity. So we can um, simplify this. So if you factor out uh, GMM over A from each term, we have a GMM over A here and a GMM, a GMM over A here. You can also factor out a 1 minus E from each term. Uh, this first term leaves a 1 half times 1 plus E. That's from the first term. And then the second term, basically you factored out all of this entire term, so that's just minus 1. Simplifying a little bit more, you'd get 1 plus e minus 2 over 2, and so 1 minus 2 will just give a minus 1. Then you can factor out the negative sign. So this thing in the bracket simplifies to this. The 1 minus e terms cancel. You have this negative sign and, that one, and the 1 half that can come out in front. And we see that the total energy is just minus one-half gmm over the semi-major axis. So we see that the energy of an elliptical orbit only depends on the semi-major axis. Uh, it doesn't depend on the eccentricity um, or semi-minor axis or any of those other um, orbital parameters. So just the semi-major axis. So uh, one of your homework problems is to go through, repeat this calculation, but pick the perihelion point instead of the aphelion point. So if you follow the um, derivation on the previous slide, uh, this should be pretty straightforward. Uh, second homework problem is that uh, is to derive the velocity of the planet as a function of its radial distance from the star from the sun. So you can start with the result that we just derived and then go back and look at uh, the other orbital equations to see if you can get the velocity in terms of just uh, the radial coordinate r and the semi-major axis a. And here's another one. So it turns out that, um, that orbital dynamics can be a little counterintuitive. So here's, um, here's a homework problem to get you to think about how changing or perturbing an orbit in a circular orbit, how that'll affect the dynamics. So in this problem, uh, we've got a, a satellite orbiting around the Earth. It's in a circular orbit. It's got some velocity v. And what we're imagining is that uh, we want to fire the thrusters on the satellite to give it a little velocity kick in four different directions. And then the question is, well, what will happen to the orbit in each of those scenarios? So when you fire the rocket to kind of push it forward, to accelerate it, to make it go faster in the same direction of its orbital velocity, that'd be case A, that's called a prograde velocity kick. So it's in the same direction as its uh, orbital velocity. So the question is, what happens? So if you increase the speed at this point, is it going to stay in a circular orbit? Is it going to turn into an elliptical orbit? Uh, what would the characteristics of that orbit be?
So it'll have a larger period, a smaller period. If you fire your thrusters in the opposite direction to slow the satellite down, so if you th fire them in this direction, the velocity will be less than it was originally, uh, and so now what's going to happen? Uh, and then the other two cases would be, what if you fire thrusters? So it, it's got this velocity component here, but then you also have a new velocity component coming in, right? So the net velocity would be kind of in that direction. And then same if you fire them going outward, if your velocity vector is now pointing up and to the right, what's going to happen? These are relatively uh, qualitative questions. Here's another homework problem that's related to all this. So... Um, uh, this is something that uh, rocket scientists have to worry about all the time. So the question is, suppose you've got a satellite in a circular orbit going around the Earth. You're piloting the space shuttle, and you're in the exact same circular orbit. You're just lagging behind the satellite by a little bit. So the question is, you want to catch up to the satellite. What do you do? And you want to catch up to it in the most energy efficient way. So you don't want to just like completely, you know, hold the thrusters on and just, you know, power your way up there by, you know, correcting the velocity as you go. You want to give the shuttle one velocity kick instantaneous and um, send it into a new orbit to try to catch up to that satellite. Uh, now, I'll give you a hint on this one. Imagine this, the satellite is going around in a circular orbit and then it comes back to this position right here. After like slightly less than one complete orbit, the satellite's going to be here. You want to produce a new orbit for your shuttle so that your shuttle comes back to that point at exactly the same time as the satellite. Okay? So we're not trying to, you know, catch up to the satellite, you know, kind of like over here somewhere. Uh, try imagining catching up to the satellite in such a way that you both, both the satellite and the shuttle, arrive at this same point at the same time. Okay. Let's see what you can do. Okay. So, um, previously I said that the total energy only depends on the semi-major axis. Uh, that's true. You can actually write it in terms of angular momentum and the eccentricity. Uh, because angular momentum depends on the eccentricity. If we want to write the total energy in terms of both eccentricity and angular momentum, it turns out that there's an advantage for doing that, for classifying different kinds of orbits. So let's go through the calculation. So the total energy is what we derived a few slides ago. Here's an expression for the angular momentum. So this uh, angular momentum does depend on the semi-major axis, which is up in that equation. So let's solve for that semi-major axis. So let's solve for 1 over a, since you have a 1 over a here. So you just divide through by all this stuff and then square each side. Uh, so you get gmm squared, 1 minus e squared, over angular momentum squared. So you can substitute this value in for 1 over a here. So that's what this is. Uh, that's that's just solving here, plugging it in there, and then now simplify. So you can group together like the g, you'll have a g times g, so that'll be a g squared, a big M squared, uh, a little m squared, but then times an extra m here over L squared. So that's just grouping things together, uh, and then times m over 2 times 1 minus e squared. So it turns out that even though we derive this equation assuming that we had an elliptical orbit, it turns out that this result is more general. It actually works for any kind of conic se section orbit. Uh, so we'll see some examples of that. So just a review, uh, remember that conic sections, um, you've, if you have a cone here and then you take a plane, a conic section is the intersection of the plane with the cone. So if you imagine like the the plane as parallel to the ground or perpendicular to that axis of symmetry of the cone, uh, you get a circle. If you tilt the plane a little bit, you'll get an ellipse. If you tilt it a little bit more so that the, the plane is now parallel to the side of the cone, you get a parabola. And if you tilt it even more, you get a hyperbola. So 
here's what those different kinds of orbits look like. They're color coded, so the circle is red, the ellipse is green, parabola is purple, and the hy hyperbola is orange. It turns out that a circle uh, has an eccentricity of zero. We've already talked about that. If you plug in eccentricity equal to zero up here, you just get a one here. All these are positive constants and you have a negative sign out in front. So the total energy of this uh, planetary orbit will have, will have a negative energy. If the eccentricity is between zero and one, uh, you, you get an ellipse, and again, you still have a negative energy. This is, for the circle, that's the, the smallest, most negative energy for, a given, for that given angular momentum. Both of these, the circle and the ellipse, are called bound orbits because as the planet orbits around the sun, it comes back on itself and just keeps repeating that figure over and over and over again. So it doesn't go flying off to infinity, but it just stays uh, within a certain region around the, the star. So, so for these values, when you have a negative energy, those are called bound orbits. The parabola happens when the eccentricity is 1 here. So when the eccentricity is 1, you get 1 minus 1 squared, which is 0. So this energy is just equal to 0. Uh, and that's just the minimum energy to create an unbound orbit where the planet will go flying off and to never return. If the eccentricity is greater than 1, uh, you get 1 minus now a number bigger than 1. So this is going to be negative, and you have a negative out front. So the total energy of that orbit is now positive. So in each of these cases, these are called unbound orbits where the object goes off to infinity. All of these trajectories have been observed in our solar system. So all the planets uh, and asteroids uh, that we see and have stick around, they're all in elliptical orbits, but they're occasionally uh, in fact, there's a comet in the sky right now as I'm recording this that because of gravitational perturbations with planets, you can steal some of the energy of a planet and get kicked into a positive energy unbound orbit. So there's a green comet right now that's be heading out of our solar system on a hyperbolic orbit. Okay, final topic is uh, something called the Virial Theorem. We're going to look at three cases that are increasingly more and more generalized. So the simplest case is for a circular orbit. So let's go and look at, uh, you can imagine the Earth going around the Sun. Let's assume that that's close to a circular orbit. The CIR, that's the circular velocity. Uh, we know that the um, you know kinetic energy is just going to be one half mass of the Earth times its circular velocity, and then we have the uh, potential energy. In a previous slide, we solved that the circular velocity was the square root of gm over r. So we'll take that, plug that in. Uh, the squared cancels out that square root sign there. And so that you get the kinetic energy is 1 half m gm over r. Combining terms, you can get this, 1 half gm m over r. And notice that the potential energy is minus gmm over r, but now the kinetic energy is a negative one half of that. So we find that the kinetic energy is just minus one half the potential energy. If you um, rewrite that, so if you cross multiply by the two, get everything on the same side, you can write it as two times the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is zero. So that's the Virial theorem. Um, this is for the simplest case of a circular orbit that if you pick the pick the planet at any particular spot in its orbit this is exactly true and instantaneously true it's always it's always just equal to that value the total energy which is the sum of kinetic plus potential energy plug those in uh, is just this value minus one half gmm over r and so that means that the total energy is just one half the potential energy. So uh, that's just a direct consequence of this also. So these relationships, again, are called the Virial Theorem. 
Let's now look at the Virial theorem for elliptical orbits. So as a planet goes around an elliptical orbit, the distance of the planet from the sun changes. When the planet is farthest from the sun, it's going to gain gravitational potential energy. And when it falls back into the sun, it's going to lose that potential energy and pick up uh, kinetic energy. So when it's closest to the sun, you'll have large kinetic energy. When it's farthest from the sun, you'll have large potential energy. So therefore, instantaneously, at any given moment, 2k plus u can't be zero because the ratio of potential to kinetic energy is constantly changing. However, um, what we're going to show is that if you take the time average of the kinetic and potential energies, you do uh, you do get the a form of the Virial theorem back. That is, you take the time averages of these quantities, and this expression is true. So, what do we mean by this time average? Well, if you take the the time average of some function of t is just uh, the integral of that function dt and you're going to integrate it over a certain amount of time. So in our case, we're going to take one orbital period. So we'll integrate from 0 to p and then divide by that, that time, that, that period. So let's calculate this. Let's look at the time average of the potential energy. Uh, let's just plug in the gravitational potential energy here for u. Um, now, there, there's a problem here where our integral is over dt, but our function is a function of r. And we don't know what r of t is. That doesn't have an analytic solution. So we have to be a little trickier. Uh, so what we're going to do is replace the dt with the d theta, because we do know what r of theta is for an elliptical orbit. So we'll use angular momentum. That's the mass times the tangential velocity component times r. Remember that v theta is d theta dt. Uh, you pick up, well, times r. So you'll, you'll pick up an extra r here to make that an r squared. So now we can solve for dt. So just cross multiply. And we see that dt is mr squared divided by the angular momentum times d theta. So we can now take this expression and plug it in for dt. So we're going to substitute that into dt. So here, this expression right here is the dt. This is just our gravitational potential energy. Pull out the constants. And so now we're going to integrate r of theta d theta. We can use the equation for an ellipse um, uh, in this form. I just plug, it, plug that in. So now instead of r, we've got this expression as a function of theta. Let's simplify it, pull out the constants. And so now we have an integral that's uh, d theta over 1 plus e cosine theta. Uh, this is not a particularly easy integral to solve, but fortunately there are integral tables. So it turns out that we can look up uh, the value of this. We also, we can get the period uh, from Kepler's third law. So we can get the period out of there and replace it with an expression in terms of the semi-major axis. Angular momentum, we already know what that is. And, and again, this integral turns out to be 2 pi over the square root of 1 minus e squared. That definite integral. So, and that's from an integral table. So, if you combine all that, smush it all together, these are the three things that we just substituted for. And now, the fun part, we start canceling stuff out. This, um, we have two square roots of 1 minus e squared on the bottom, and it cancels that one on the top. We can cancel the m's can cancel the square root of gm's, the four pi's, the square root of four pi squares cancels the two pi up top, and all of this simplifies down to minus gm m over a, which is exactly the same 
close to what we found for a circular orbit, except for now we have the semi-major axis instead of just the radius of the circular orbit. You can go through a similar calculation, which is a little bit more complicated, uh, for the kinetic energy. Uh, you want to write uh, the velocity in terms of uh, theta, and then you have another integral to solve, and you can show that it's one-half gmm over a. So comparing this with this shows that uh, twice the kinetic energy plus the potential energy sums to zero. So this is the virial theorem for elliptical orbits. Okay, one last version of the virial theorem. It turns out that the virial theorem is very general. So suppose now you just had a bunch of, say, stars in a star cluster. They're all moving around and influenced by their own mutual gravity. You could define the total kinetic energy of the system as just summing up the kinetic energies of each star. Same with their potential energies. Um, your textbook goes through um, a somewhat involved calculation uh, that shows that in a very general case, if you have a system of particles that only interact gravitationally, and these averages are now over a sufficiently long amount of time, so you don't have a single period to average over, you just take it over um, many, say, like relaxation times, that you, re you recover the virial theorem. So twice the average kinetic energy of the total kinetic energy of the whole system plus the average, the time average of the total potential energy of the system, that equals zero. It has the exact same form as what we've seen before. This has a very practical application, and that is uh, there are lots of star clusters in our galaxy and in the universe that uh, stars are, sometimes stars are born into these clusters or groups of stars, and um, you can use the virial theorem to weigh the cluster. So if you look at the uh, random uh, motions of all these stars as they kind of uh, fly around uh, in the star cluster, if you, if you look at the, a snapshot of what the uh, velocities are, you can use that to estimate what the potential energy of the cluster is, and from that you can infer what the mass of it must be. Um, so anyway, uh, it, this, this does have a lot of very useful applications throughout astronomy. Okay, so we've introduced some more concepts. So this is just a, an update of that previous summary page. So we've updated it to include uh, the total energy in the list of conserved quantities. Um, and uh, perhaps, yeah, we've talked about the velocity a little bit more too. Here's an updated little um, table showing the dependence on all of our equations. So I've added the total energy of our ellipse both in terms of the semi-major axis and the eccentricity and the angular momentum, so both of those equations. Um, this was a homework problem that uh, you'll, you'll derive this result. And this result up here, um, we haven't derived that one. That's a new equation. Uh, sometimes it's helpful, so I'll, I'll, include it. Uh, I'll include it here. Anyway, if, again, if you find this table useful, great. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, up next, we will uh, look at one last application of elliptical or orbits, which is called the Hohmann transfer.